This is another foundational message for our church because this passage is what God used to give me the philosophy of my ministry before he called me or when he was calling me into ministry. Uh, he laid this passage heavy, heavy upon my heart and spoke powerfully, powerfully to me that if this was not part of my life, that nothing that would happen would be from him. And so uh, that's what we're going to study this morning. Uh, but before we read 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, we need to go back to Genesis 3. This is where everything started in terms of the fall of man. And when Satan presented the temptation to Eve and Adam was right there with her, remember he appealed to her senses. He appealed to her desires. And those desires became corrupted with a matter of seconds. And as he was lying, he was giving the famous sandwich of the two pieces of bread being the truth of God, and in the middle, the actual meat of the sandwich was the lie. And that's exactly how Satan works today. He mixes truth with lies to deceive us. And as he is talking uh, to the woman, and he is deceiving her in Genesis 3, 5, he says at the very end, the last lie, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So meaning, meaning, meaning tempting her lying, saying God's not really good like he says he is. So that's the first uh, door open to dying spiritually. And then verse 6, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And so what happened at that moment was a decision to depend not on God any longer, but to depend on man, and man's wisdom, man's self-confidence, man's self-dependency. That's the definition of humanism. And Dr. Francis Schaeffer in the 70s started teaching this to the churches, that every part of American culture was going towards humanism. And the churches were not catching up with what Francis Schaeffer was teaching them. This is where everything is going. The man is the end of himself. Man is the savior of everything. Man doesn't need God anymore. Man will be so technologically astute and, and arrive at such a high level of intelligence that no longer God will be necessary. So that lie that, that was so powerful in the 60s and 70s that started, and now we see what is happening when that is giving, being full born, this happened all the way back in Genesis 3. That our tendency, our sinfulness, is not to depend on God, to say, God, I can handle life on my own. I get enough education, I get enough contacts, my personality, uh, my physical appearance, my athletic ability, uh, whatever it may be, my math skills, I will depend on these things, my skills, my talents, my education, my family, my ability, my friends to have success and to be able to achieve what I want to achieve, whatever those dreams and desires are. Man is the end of himself in humanism. And this is what Paul was attacking in the book of Corinthians. Because remember, the false apostles, the Judaizers, the, what was been called sometimes the super apostles, were attacking Paul's credentials, his credibility as an apostle. So if, for example, a witness uh, saw uh, something that, that he's going to testify in court, the defense is going to attack the what of that witness, the credibility of that witness, so that no one will believe her or his uh, testimony on the stand. And that is a, a tactic that is used all through the court systems, tactic credibility of the witness so that no one believes what? His message or his teaching. And this is what they were trying to do to the Apostle Paul. So the Corinthians were struggling with their own wicked, sinful flesh. But at the same time, Paul trying to minister to them to correct them, to teach them right doctrine, right Christian living. But he was so attacked with his credibility, the Corinthians were in the middle. Do we really believe the, the credibility and the, uh, the authority of the Apostle Paul? So Paul spends much of his time in First and Second Corinthians doing what? Defending his apostolic authority as the teacher for that church. And so what happens to today? Men will attack the credibility of strong preachers of God's word so that people don't listen to what? His message. That is the cross of Christ. And so this passage, I'm gonna, we're going to read it together quickly. 
And then go back a little bit to understand the context of chapter 2. Paul says this, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined, right? He made a willful decision to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not persuasive words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So right in the very middle of Corinth, what is the context Paul is speaking into with these believers? They are in the center of a Greek major city, Roman Greco city, that has wealth, has money, has education, has everything you can imagine a city could have. And it basically be like living in the middle of Las Vegas in 2019. They had everything in Corinth. And they were extremely fleshly, they were extremely humanistic, and for them the value that they had in their society was placed on Greek eloquence. Your ability to be a good teacher. That was predominant in the culture. And Paul is saying, that is exactly what I'm going to attack. Because in chapter 1, he gives the basis, the foundation for what he's teaching in chapter 2. And so even though it is, uh, we're going to read verses 18 through 31 in chapter 1. It's a little bit longer, but we need to, to understand why Paul is writing what he's writing in chapter 2. Verse 18 of chapter 1. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the what? The power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For he Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that you are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by doing his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen? And so for a Greek mindset, the cross means nothing. Why would I ever listen to the message about a man dying on the cross when it was totally unnecessary? Why is that the source of all power of the universe? For the Jew, they constantly wanted signs. They did not believe in God. No matter how many signs Jesus did, they didn't believe he was the Son of God. And for Greeks, all the weight was put on eloquence. And today, we have the same tendency. We have, and this is true, we have a lot of great Bible teachers in this country. Is that true or not? Okay, so why is our country in so great a peril? Why are people in so much suffering in part of the church that statistically everything the world does in terms of sin is found exactly in the church. So why would all these literally thousands of Bible conferences, we have Christian radios, no matter where you go in the U.S., you can turn on Christian radio, right? You can listen to any sermon and very good sermons at any time you want to on your phone. And yet we have no change. Our culture and if you read the news this week, it's going down worse and worse. Just as, think, as you think, oh, it can't get any worse. We can't get any more crazy with the laws we're approving. And sure enough, it does. So with all of this great, wonderful Bible teaching, why is there no change? Why are people suffering? Why are people in the church committing suicide? 
part of Harvest Church in California. And then a week ago, a, a main pastor uh, committed suicide. And so, good doctrine, great family, he had little kids, and yet he committed suicide. And these things are getting worse. Our churches have huge, massive buildings. We have an enormous amount of church members. We have an enormous amount of money. We have books, so many books that we don't even know what to do with. Pastors have so many volumes and volumes of libraries, they have to actually extend their libraries in other offices and use their home. And yet we have no power in our churches. This is what Paul is talking about. We want great Bible teachers, but we think we don't need the power of God. We just need the knowledge. But Paul says, I didn't come with you, to you, in all this knowledge. I came to you in the spirit and in power. Here's what's interesting about Corinthians. This is the most probably pagan carnal uh, church that existed among all these apostolic churches. Paul uses the word power in reference to the power of God 14 times in this book. The only book that's more is the book of Revelation using the power word or power of God or the power that was going on and the power plays that were going on in the book of Revelation. So Paul has a specific reason why he's talking so much about the source of power. See, we're good as Americans at trying very hard and having character and being determined in our work ethic. No one really has been accused, at least the majority of generations through the history of our nation, as being lazy. There are many, many hardworking Americans. But here's the problem. We're good at working hard at life, but we're not good at working hard at prayer. We try hard in everything, except we don't try hard in prayer. And that's where the source of power is. And, and here's the point. Most of us in our entire life, and I've done this in my own life far too many times, is we live our life trying to power our entire house with this double-A battery. We're thinking this battery will power my entire house. And we know that's ridiculous to even think about. It can barely, barely power this microphone in an hour without draining the battery. And yet that's how most people who call themselves believers live their Christian life. They have the power that is far greater than the world's greatest nuclear power plant with clean energy if you can imagine that with a nuclear power plant, and to my knowledge, France is the most nuclear power plants per country than anywhere in the world. Some of the biggest nuclear reactors, as such the US has and Japan has, and yet we live our life based on a battery because we really don't believe, number one, in the power of God. And the reason we know we don't really believe in the power of God and we trust our own power and ability first is because we are a nation that does not pray. And so you can ask yourselves, how much do I really trust in my own ability to get work done, to get things accomplished, and sometimes for God's kingdom? On my own power versus trusting in God alone, all of you is think back in the past six months, how much time did you spend in prayer? And there's your answer. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Are you living based on your own power or on God's power? And here's the scariest thing. Even as a believer, when I live trusting my own ability to figure out how to solve these problems, I'm actually walking in humanism. Everything is man-centered and really very little is God-centered except Sunday morning service. But other than that, the rest of the week, it's all man-centeredness. I know how to do my job. I know how to do my classwork. I know how to talk to these people. I know how to pay my bills. We are so scientific and humanistic, we don't even realize what it means to live in the power of God. We don't know what it means to experience the power of God in the service. 
in a worship service or through the sermon or when someone comes to Christ. Years go by, and because we're so accustomed to never experiencing the power of God, we honestly start to believe that it really doesn't exist except to save me from hell. I believe in that because I don't want to go to hell. But other than that, for my day-to-day life, I really don't believe in the power of God, which is why I don't pray. And this is the part preaching to myself when, when that stress keeps coming and that, that anxiety, that fretting keeps coming and it won't stop and it actually gets worse. And no matter what I do, I can't seem to stop it. It's like a train that, that has no brakes. And the train just keeps going and going and going and I can't stop and no matter what I do. It's at that point, many times, God disciplines us and gets to this point of just saying, just stop. You either trust in my power or you trust in your own power. There is no other option. And so part of it is our, our theology. Part of it is we don't have renewed minds. And we've gone to church all our life, but we still don't have renewed minds because we really are, are, are listening to the teaching of the world and the church instead of the Bible. Paul never, the smartest man after Jesus, Paul was probably academically the smartest man that walked through the pages of Scripture. And yet he would not rest on his own academic intellectualism. He only rested on the message of Christ and Him crucified. It wasn't a bunch of PhDs sitting around the table discussing doctrine. It was preaching Christ, bloody, tortured, crucified, beaten up, hung on a cross, died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Repent and believe was what Peter preached. There's nothing else but that. And yet we filled our churches with so many millions and millions of dollars with everything you could possibly think of for children's ministry, youth ministry, youth camps. And yet there is no power. I honestly, not to be pessimistic, but a but struggle in my mind. We build multi-million dollar camps for high schoolers and for junior hires. And yet the majority of them all turn from Christ once they graduate high school. Why? It makes absolutely no sense why we're putting all this time, energy, and money in all of these buildings and resources when all these kids are turning from Christ left, right, and center. Why is it happening? Because there's no power in our churches. Because there's no power in the preacher. There's no power in the message. Because he's focused on his eloquence. He's focusing, hey, how are y'all doing this morning? Aren't you glad to be a part of this church? One of the greatest, coolest, hickest church around. And you're going to feel good in our church. People want to hear that kind of message. They want the light, fluffy messages. Because they don't want to be convicted. But where there is conviction and response and obedience, the power of God comes down from heaven. And you ask yourself, why are people not discerning? They can't discern the times. It's because they don't obey. You can only have spiritual discernment and really understand what is good and what is evil, what is correct and what is good, sacrificing versus obedience, by obeying. If you don't obey, when God tells you to go, if you don't go, you will have no discernment. Your discernment will shut down. And you will not understand what's going around. You will not be able to assess the spirit that's around you. Because you don't obey the word of God. And so why is there no discernment in our church to distinguish between good and evil? Because we have massive, massive amounts of churches filled with people who do not obey God's word. Therefore, there is no discernment. Zechariah 4, 6 says this, and he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's by God's power alone. So do scientific, humanistic Americans that go to church every Sunday really believe in the power of God to do anything that God wants? It's Jesus' question to Philip. They have to feed 5,000 people, 5,000 men at least. Who knows how many women and children? Uh, Philip, where's the money for all these people? Is it in your pocket? 
And it shocked the life out of Philip. How? I, it would take a year's salary to feed all these people. And Jesus asked him that question on purpose to get that reaction from Philip. With you, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. But here's the point. When God says he is all-powerful, here's the question. Even a five-year-old can understand that God is powerful, but you and I usually do not believe it. And the reason why we know we don't believe it is because we really don't care that much about prayer. We really don't. Luke 4.14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit of Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout the, all the surrounding country. He fasted and the wilderness was tempted by Satan. It's God himself, but he was anointed from on high with the power of the Holy Spirit to do the next three years of ministry. If that's Jesus, the Son of God, walking according to the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more do you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to even get a cup of coffee with the right attitude? To get up out of bed without sitting within five seconds? You see, we think, oh, I've been a Christian for so long now. I've been hearing such great Bible teaching. I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to trust in all the Christian books I've read. You are a humanist. Because you really don't believe in the power of the cross. You really don't believe you need the cross of Christ every day. So instead of the cross getting bigger and bigger every day, the cross is getting smaller and smaller in your life. Because you're so smart now in the Bible, you really don't need Jesus anymore. You've surpassed him. You've become a good Mormon. And that's what our churches are filled with. Church members that know the Bible backwards and forwards. And they can quote scripture all over the place. But there's no power in their life. There's no power in their teaching. There's no power in their messages. Therefore, there's no conviction. There's no change. There's no transformation. And Paul came to the Corinthians being so attacked about his authenticity as an apostle. And he, and the way he defended himself was talking about the cross. The power is in the cross of Christ. The power is in a crucified Christ. The Greeks despise it. The Jews hate him. But it is the source of all power. And so most, <clears throat> if not all, of the suffering in your life and in my life is not because of the trials and tribulations that God allows to come our way. It is simply because we have no power to deal with them. And when you have no power to deal with them, you feel, and I feel, awful. It's like having a trailer that weighs 10,000 pounds and pulling it with a four-cylinder minivan. You're going to feel awful. It's an awful feeling to pull a heavy, heavy trailer with an engine that can't do much of anything. It makes you feel impotent. But when you pull a heavy trailer with a Cummins diesel, it's like, wow, this feels good. Like, actually, I like pulling the heavy trailer because it makes me feel like I have a lot of power. Because the engine, the diesel engine that's pulling it, it's doing the work, I just get to drive the steering wheel. And it's fun. Because you feel the power. You think, oh, let's not talk about feelings. Well, Jesus felt the power when the sick woman touched him. Who touched me? Because Jesus, it says, felt the power, what? Go through him and leave him to the woman and healed her from all her bleeding. And so there is a feeling element attached to the power of God. And when I've been preaching in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, and it's the power of God in his word, I have felt the power of God go through my body in preaching. Because it's the proclamation of Christ and him crucified. So that's not something mystical. That is the power of God. When someone experiences going from death to life and receiving salvation, that weight is taken off their shoulders. That's the feeling of the power of God being experienced for the first time in their life. Every single person I've had the privilege to lead to Christ has said, when I've asked them, how do you feel now? I, there's this huge weight that's off my shoulders now. And usually the person's crying when they're telling me that. Well, well, how did that happen? The person was able to take that burden off their back? It, it, no, it was the power of God that took that burden. It says, Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress, huge heavy burden. He could barely make it up to the hill, but when he got to the cross, the burden rolled down the hill. 
off of his back for all of eternity. It was him getting to the foot of the cross and immediately the burden fell. But before that, he thought the burden was going to crush him and kill him. And everyone was ridiculing him for that, carrying that stupid burden on his back. Even his own family were ridiculing him. Why do you have that burden on your back? When all of them had it, but never saw it, never felt it as Christian did, because Christian was going to the celestial city. And because he was on the journey, the burden was overwhelming to him. He had to get rid of it. 1 Corinthians 1.17 for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Do you understand the, the importance of that verse? So when preachers and teachers in the, of the Bible are really, really good at public speaking, that is one of the most dangerous things a preacher can ever have, is it not? A true preacher will stumble over his words. He will not be exactly eloquent in his pronunciations. He will do everything so that the cross of Christ is not empty of its power. This church does not need everything under the sun to be professional. To have all the money, the right building, the right worship team, the right staff, the right people in place. That is all humanistic. That is all man-dependent. But when the message of Christ is preached, God moves mountains. He changes things that you and I could never and will never humanly possibly change. Things that have caused addictions and bondages from your past that are still tormenting you today that you will never change on your own unless the power of God comes down on your life. This is not Pentecostalism. This is sound biblical doctrine. You cannot be saved apart from the power of God. And someone says, I prayed a little prayer when I was 10 years old. Did you ever experience the power of God in your life? Well, not really. I don't know what that means. Then you probably aren't saved. Well, that sounds like emotionalism, and I don't agree with that. Then you don't agree with the Word of God. You are more spiritual than God Himself. You are saying you don't need the power of God to be saved. You just need a little prayer. And so you're humanistic in your thinking. You're saying that a prayer saves you. But from what I read in Scripture, only the blood of Jesus Christ saves you from your sins. A prayer does not save you. Most people are trusting in their prayer, and they are living in a false sense of security. They have no true salvation. But they, boy, do they trust in that prayer at that camp. When they were singing Kumbaya on the campfire, boy, do they know that they trust in that prayer. But there's no power in their life. And people don't know this. They don't know what their Christian life should look like. They want to know. They desire to know. But no one is telling them. No one is teaching them what it should look like. 1 Corinthians 4.20. It just keeps going. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. So all the Christians around you and I were really, really good talkers at 7 o'clock Bible study, right? Hey, let's all share our opinion about this text for the next hour and a half. Yeah, I always wonder, what good does that do? Men I've known have been in the same part of the same Bible study for 15 years, and they all share their opinion about what the text means or, or how to think about this, that, or the other with a certain passage of Scripture. But there's no real change in their life. It is a cultural religious event that they're participating in. See, we don't need more Christian activity and Christian ministries. We need the power of God to change us. I can't change my marriage, my children, my own life without the power of God. I can't make my heart tick without the power of God. I can't take one step without the power of God. We cannot change one hair on our head except by the power of God. God is the God of power beyond our understanding. 
There is no limit. If God can create all the stars and planets in the universe, even black holes that scientists don't even know what a black hole is, but they know it exists, they know that there's at least about 12 dimensions that exist in the universe, they can't even comprehend how that all works together. And yet God, in the spoken word, created it in one second. We cannot understand the mind of God, so let God be a mystery. Don't try to figure out God, but revel and rest and trust in His universal, overwhelming, infinite power. And that is the definition of a person at peace and walking and living in joy. Isaiah 40 29, he gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Do you want God to do that for you today? Do you want God to do that for you right now? When you're weak, you feel sick, and many of you do right now, you don't feel very good. You say, Well, it's my body, it's the world we live in, it's all the germs and disease, and that's true. And sin has its effect on all of us. But yet, do you believe in the power of God? Do you believe that God is saying what he said in Isaiah 40, that he really does give power to the faint? Does he, that he really gives strength to those that feel utterly weak and stressed out and feel like total failures? And think, of, man, I feel like such a loser. I feel like such a failure. I've messed up so many times. I can't get out of these things. Well, good that you feel that way. Because you should. Because only the power of God can change you. And so if God's letting you fail to feel like a total, complete loser, that's because you are one. And I am too. And when we rest in the power of God, He raises us up and shows us it's all my power. You have nothing to do with it. It's all me. I will not share my glory with another. And that jealousy of God gives me the most wonderful, powerful security I could ever imagine. It's the power of God that raises me up. And you think, well, Jared, that, 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 this just shows that you're, you're saying that we're not, we're not worthy. Like, like we're, we're so dirty and vile that there's nothing good in us. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. We are created in the image of God. We have infinite worth because God created us. Amen? But we are unworthy to receive the blood of Christ. I do not deserve salvation. You don't deserve salvation. And so when God gets me to the end of myself, I can't control what's going on around me. I can't stop what's happening. I can't control my body. I can't control my health. I can't control what's happening to a family member. I can't control their decisions, the bad decisions that are affecting all of us. And God says, that's exactly right. You can't control any of it. When I understand that God is sovereign, that he has complete rule and reign, that is going to produce humility in me and a trust in his power and in his wisdom. In Psalm 68, 35, awesome is God from the sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. He is the one that gives you the strength and the power, amen? You can't live this Christian life without God's power. The cross being big in your life every day, it is impossible. Try to be a good Christian and see how it works out for you. Let's talk in five years. And you're going to have a lot of bad stories. And you're going to come to the point, by God's faithfulness, come to the end of yourself. You can't be a good Christian on your own. The cross has to become bigger and more powerfully present in your life. Psalm 62, 11, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you, it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. God. We are utterly, totally, 110% dependent on God the Father. Amen? We have nothing apart from Him. As Jonathan Evans, as I mentioned a couple months ago, what glorifies God the most is utter dependency on Him. And we think, no, 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 what glorifies God is that we show God, God, I can do it on my own. Watch, watch what I can do. It's 
It's like the little five-year-old that rides his bike for the first time on his own. Daddy, daddy, look what I can do. I can ride it on my own. And we're like, wow, we applaud it. Think, wow, that's great. He can ride his bike on his own. And we do the same thing with God. And God is looking at it. No, that's not great. That's not what I want for you. And you will suffer in vain. You can't ride that bike on your own. So don't even try. Because when you try and you accomplish it, you glow. You glorify yourself. Other people glorify you, but God is not glorified. So don't ever lose that need of being that little child crawling up in his mom or his dad's lap and knowing I need my mom, my dad for sustenance and for life. I can't make it one second without him. One second without her. But as we grow older, we become more independent. Oh, I don't need my parents as much as I did 10 years ago. I can do my own thing. And so we carry that attitude over with God, and we treat God the same way. I've been a Christian long enough now. I don't need to pray so much. I don't need to read the Bible as much. I've already done that for 30 years. I've got it figured out. And the cross now is this size. And you have no power in your life. Because you've lost the source of the power, trusting in yourself. One of my greatest fears is God blessing this church to the extent of there's a lot of people being transformed and impacted in this valley. And then as time goes on because of that fruit, just like what happened to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, God warned him, God warned him, God warned him, do not get to the point after you get blessed, after you enter the promised land, that you say, by my own power I have created this wealth. And the book of Deuteronomy best describes the status of our nation, of where we're at. I have created my own wealth. I have created these big churches. I have created these churches filled with 5,000 people. And God is up in heaven responding, you have done nothing. You are nothing without me. You have no power without me. If I were to take my hand away from you for one second, you would vaporize, and your body would turn to dust and ashes. And if we've lost our proper view of God, that's why Americans now have no fear of God. That is something only old people have. That was past generations, but now we've matured. Now we're more educated, we're more progressive. Now we don't have to shake in our boots at the thought of the power and the wrath and the awesomeness of God. I'm well past that in my life. I'm not immature anymore like that. I'm not scared of God anymore. You better be. And I better be. It is a powerful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God, is it not? The God who can take your soul and send it to an eternity in hell or an eternity in heaven. That is scary. And when I allow the fear of God to penetrate my life, I don't make the same decisions everyone else makes. I don't listen to what the world tells me to do. I don't listen to family. I don't listen to friends. I listen to the very word of God because God has placed this fear in my heart. The power belongs to God. It is his spirit that does the work. Psalm 147.5, God great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Amen. And Revelation 19.1, after this I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. See, the more you believe and understand the power of God, the more you're going to worship and praise Him. Amen. The more you're going to give Him the glory, Him the the praise and adoration that he alone deserves. But when you see that building, but when you see the masses of the people, but when you see all the money and the resources, your tendency and my tendency is to think, think what? Wow, great a work we have done together. Look at the Tower of Babel we have built with our own hands. And such is the American church today. Look at what we have done. Look at all the missionaries we've sent around the world. There is no power in the messenger, only in the message of Jesus and him crucified. This simple 
old message of the cross of Calvary. A bloody, crucified Savior that took your place on the cross, that shed his blood, was tortured, was abused, was, was mocked and ridiculed because he loved you and because God knows you have no power on your own. That is the simple gospel message. And that's why God's word says today is the day of salvation. When you believe that God is the only source of your power, you won't keep trying hard. You will start to pray hard. And you won't keep fretting. You're going to start resting. No more fretting. Psalm 37. You're going to start resting. And that's one of the greatest struggles in my own life is to stop fretting, which is stress, and start resting. And I can't get to the resting part unless I work hard at prayer. And no one likes to pray at first. It is hard work to force yourself to get on your knees and cry out to the Lord, is it not? And I have to force myself, and it's usually about 10, 15 minutes of breaking through the walls and fighting my own flesh to get to the point of communion and presence of God where I sense the power of God in my prayer life. The Holy Spirit is taking over. And it's no longer my will, me praying for what I want, and now it's God through me changing my prayers to pray what God wants to happen in my life and in the life of other people. And usually that's about 10 or 15 minutes at least. So where is the source of your power? When you think about all that you need to accomplish this next week, these next months, are you going to do whatever it is in your own power or in the power of God? Because if it's in your own power, you know that it's going to fail. You might accomplish things, humanly speaking. You might survive and get by and, and feel a sense of accomplishment. But you need to know this. If it's done in your own power, there is no eternal reward or value in what you've done. So what you're saying, Pastor Jared, is I just wasted six months of my life? That's exactly right. You just wasted six months of your life. Because your source of power was you. And that means if it was, if I did it in my own strength and my own power, whether it was a sermon, whether it was telling the gospel to someone and I trusted myself, it was not to the glory of God. And God did not smile upon me because he saw my heart. He saw what was going on inside of me. And I lost that moment for all of eternity. And so as a church, and as God is forming this church, what will this church be based on? At what source of power? Are we going to live like this double-A battery? And honestly, we could. We could easily think that everything's going great and see little things here and there and think, wow, this is great. And yet we're content with the power of a double-A battery when we have a complete nuclear power plant to live our lives, to glorify God, to build His kingdom, and yet we never, ever even consider it. That is what I'm the most nervous about. That is what makes me the most fearful. Is, is that going to happen to us? Are we going to trust in medicine? Are we going to trust in doctors? Are we going to trust in our own know-how and our own ability? Are we going to trust in technology? Are we going to trust in people that may be coming new to our church? Think, wow, this family is great. They have so many contacts and resources. They're going to be such a blessing in our church. And humanly, we're what? We're excited. And God's looking down upon us and heaven thinking, what are you doing? You're trusting in man instead of me. And because thank the Lord that he is the way he is, that he is a jealous God, he will never tolerate that. God uses the foolish things the ones that are not noble, the ones that are not highly educated, to glorify him. And Paul is telling the Corinthians, he's basically giving a backhand compliment, that you guys, humanly speaking, sorry, you're not much to look at. And it's exactly who God uses. I'll give you an example. Edgar, to be a pastor in Maldagalpa, never in a million years would I think he could become a leader. I would say, Edgar, no way, not going to happen. Because I know, I've been in leadership long enough, I've seen good leaders, I've seen good leaders, he's not going to be one of them. He's not going to be a good leader. 
and yet God raised them up, showing me what, as the leader and founder of that church planning movement, uh, God is saying and showing me, Jared, you have no idea what you're doing. I'm the one that raises up and takes down men. You have no idea what I'm doing. And so when people come in, or when the fact that they were in a garage, in my spirit, and in my flesh doesn't make sense, in my spirit I love it. Because that's how God works. He uses foolish things, things of, and another translation would be things of disgrace, to glorify Him and show that man is foolish. I don't reside, I don't need a temple. God does not reside in a temple. God resides up in heaven. He has no need for a building. So how about we stop putting the focus on buildings and technology and having everything attractive to people and how about we start putting the attention on the power of God falling down upon us? And that does not mean speaking in tongues or having these euphoric, uh, mystical experiences. What that means is when the power of God comes down upon us, we become more like Christ. We confess, we repent. There are massive changes that, that take place in our character. That is what happens when the power of God comes. And we take steps of faith to live and preach and build God's kingdom. That's what happens. God does that transformation in our life. He convicts us. He moves our hearts. He breaks us down. He produces contriteness and humility in us. That is what the power of God does in our hearts and lives. Amen? And after what the women did Friday night, that's what they have to go through. Going through that repentance and transformation. They got too crazy in their party. Those baby showers are dangerous. And so when Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he's telling them this is the source of all power. It's God's message of salvation of Christ being crucified. And the Spirit of God working among us and working among you. That weakness, that fear, that trembling, man does not, does not appreciate that. If I was up here and every Sunday trembling and stuttering, you would think, well, we probably don't really have a good church because no one's going to want to come and listen to that. There's no confidence, there's no eloquence, there's no ability in speaking. Might as well not invite anyone to our church. And God is in heaven, and what God teaches us in His Word is that is not ever how God works. Man wants the Saul, the King Saul. God uses the little shepherd boy. And we need to be content with that. We need to understand that that's how God works. So if you're struggling, you don't even know how to do certain ministries, or even work the computer, praise God for your limitations, amen? Praise God for when things don't work out the way you wanted them to work out. And we couldn't accomplish everything in a week you wanted to accomplish. High pay perfectionist. Oh, I still feel so frustrated. I'm not building God's team at all. Right? I'm justifying, right? My work. And God continually has to remind us, I'm going to let you fail and fail as much as you need to until you rest alone on my power. And that is one of the greatest gifts outside of salvation that God can give you to where you become less and God becomes more. And you realize everything depends on God's spirit and God's power. And that leads me to the final point. And our Hermit study has been very good, but this Wednesday I want all of you here Wednesday night for prayer and the Spanish. And we're going to have two groups, one Spanish, one English, have a small devotional and pray for these things specifically that the power of God is experienced in our hearts and lives. And that we do become more like Christ. And that we see the power of God working and changing people among us. And that means brand new families. You need to understand from me, from this pulpit, I don't want people part of this church that just came from another church after 20 years. You cannot build a healthy biblical church with that. You want people that God sends to this church that know nothing about the Bible or the Gospel. And they hear the Gospel, they hear the Word of God for the first time. That's who you want God to bring. That's how God builds a brand new church. Amen? And so, this Wednesday at 6.30, we're going to put uh, what we believe in practice. Because if it's what we believe, we will do it. 
and will make the priority. Lord, take away distractions, take away obstacles, protect me from the lies of Satan and from the attacks of the enemy that we may get together on Wednesday night and pray and call out the name of God together. And truly believe, before we even utter one word starting the time of prayer, we truly believe in the power of God. Because if not, we shouldn't be praying. But if we really believe in the power of God, may we pray according to that reality and to that truth. 